Well, my name is Pastor Pradeep, and so glad you guys are here at the 18 plus God Party in Highland Township. How many of you guys thought you were going to get murdered if it was your first time out here on this dirt road? We are literally in between an apple orchard and a Christmas tree farm. It's pretty scary out being out here, but don't worry, you got a brown man with a beard and a bacon suit to preach a message to you. I am a pastor. So God bless you all. <laughs> I'm going to be sharing for about the next 20, 25 minutes, and uh, I'm so glad you guys are here. I just got to say, you guys look really good. Can you give yourselves a massive round of applause? You look good. Nothing to be ashamed about tonight. You know, we are, we are um, really just celebrating tonight. Um, you know, this 18 plus God party, we exist here to lead young adults into growing relationships with Jesus Christ and one another. And we party, say, if you know it, we party for life. You know, the scriptures in John 10.10, 10, these ancient scriptures, Jesus says something. A lot of people don't really know what Jesus was doing on the earth. People who aren't familiar with Christianity, sometimes they get confused in how complicated it can be or bad impressions with the church they might get. But Christianity is pretty simple. There's a scripture in John 10.10, 10, kind of where we get this, we party for life atmosphere here. And it says this, the devil, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy and we've seen lots of young adults where they've had great dreams or destinies and things have been stolen, killed, or destroyed in their life. But then Jesus says, I came to the earth so that you might have life and life more abundantly. And so that's why we exist. We're glad you guys are here. And I want to talk about this whole idea of trick or treat. As we saw in this video, there's a bunch of little baby kids, little embryos, that had gone trick-or-treating all night, filled up their little pillowcases, and they got all this candy, and they came home, and Jimmy Kimmel said, hey, lie to your children. I, and everybody's like, I will lie to my children, because this guy on TV said so. I'll do it. And so they tell their kids, hey, we uh, ate all your candy, and we saw their responses. And uh, I want to you know, confess a little of my past to you guys, but it is very satisfying to crush the dreams of a child. <laughs> who, who disagrees? <laughs> who agrees? It's just, there's a special satisfaction there. Thank you. Special satisfaction. I remember when I was in high school, I used to trick little children on Halloween. And by trick, I mean uh, beat them up and steal their candy. And then run away with my friends on a truck bed and then shoot them with paintballs as they cried. And they fell for it every time. They fell for it every time. I like tricking little kids, but I remember it didn't feel so good when I got tricked as a little kid because uh, I grew up in Minnesota, and we went trick-or-treating. There was this huge snowstorm in 1991 when I was trick-or-treating, and uh, parents were freaking out that year because of the snowstorm and because there was a rumor. Apparently, as kids were going around collecting their candy, they discovered that some of the Snicker bars and Twix and different things were filled with razor blades. Have you guys heard about this? Some were filled with needles or poison, and these kids are like, trick or treat, and the adults are like, all right, I'll trick you. I'll put a razor blade in your Kit Kat. Give me a break. <laughs> and so these kids would like try to eat a sweet candy, and they got a really bad trick. Now, I feel like a good guy to you now compared to my prank, don't I? I won your hearts. And anyways... They would get these candies, and there would be razor blades, and they'd cut their mouth. They would swallow a needle and things like that. And parents, as you could, uh, you know, really relate to or understand, they were, like, super panicking about kids trick-or-treating because they didn't want their throats to be cut up, understandably. And uh, they were warning everybody. There was all these committees that were formed, and they were saying, you know, we got to warn the children, 364 days of the year, we tell our children, don't take strangers from candy. <laughs> and there's only one day of the year, we specifically tell our kids to take strangers, stranger candy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, now, and now you took that day away from us with your razor blades? <laughs> you sick people. <laughs> and uh, they made these committees, and they're warning people. And uh, there's a spiritual principle from this that I, I want to communicate because when these parents understood that their kids were trying to get something sweet, but something destructive actually was what they got, they immediately began to warn them and say, don't take candy from these certain areas. Be careful what you're getting. And in life, 
I see that there are a lot of times, especially us as young adults, where we are expecting something sweet, we're expecting something good, but there's actually destruction in it. We're actually expecting a treat, but we really get a trick. There's a scripture in Proverbs 14.12. It's this ancient book in the Bible, Proverbs 14.12, and it says this. There's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. And I believe that there is a trap, there is a trick that many of us have bought into when we try to answer the question as we're going through life, as we're young adults, we're trying to find our place in this world, our purpose, our destiny. We're trying to make big decisions and we try to answer this question in our lives. What is success for me? How can I be successful? And most of us have been taught what I believe is actually a trick when we think it's a treat. We've been taught that for us to be successful, we need to acquire more money. We need to acquire more education, accolades. We need to acquire more experiences. But today, in the rest of this message, I want to communicate that there is something fundamentally wrong when we perceive success in our lives outside of relationships. We aren't designed to simply collect experiences. We aren't designed to simply get money and get rich. We aren't designed to simply get a higher education and accolades. If we achieve or try to strive for those achievements, we're going to end up on a path to destruction. You know, when I was a, a kid, my parents who were raised in Sri Lanka during a time of war and genocide, they wanted me to be raised in America. I'm the first person in my family born in America. And they wanted to raise me with the American dream. My whole life, I would ask my family, you know, what do you want me to do? What are your dreams for me? And they would say this, baby Pradeepin, what we want you to do is we want you to get a good job. We want you to get a great education, and we will be happy with you. You will have arrived. This is our dream for you. We want you to make lots of money, and we want you to have a lot of education. They totally bought into the American dream. Well, I, I totally bought into that. I was like, all right, I will try. And my family tried. They went to school. They put themselves through school. They got jobs. They worked for a pacemaker company. If you guys know my little story from a couple weeks ago about pacemakers, that's how I got pacemaker stocks. God bless them. And uh, so they, they bought a house, but as they really bought into this American dream about education and money, our family actually started to tear apart, and disaster started to come upon our family. I remember they would work all day and work all night, and I was kind of a latchkey kid, and I, I remember one day they came home, and they said, Pradeepin, you know what? Our family is not working anymore. Uh, we're going to go, we're going to get a divorce. And it, it hit me so fast and so hard. It was traumatizing. I know many of us understand that. But as they bought into these solutions, they found that our family was actually deteriorating. Our quality of life was actually suffering. And pretty soon, my family just went into a tailspin. My dad, he got a DUI from drinking and driving. They got a divorce. My mom, she was not able to work. She started going in and out of mental hospitals. Trying to pursue the American dream, she realized, I'm not fit for this. She started living out of her car and just selling jewelry to live. I mean, my sister was going off the deep end. I got suicidal and depressed and all these things, just trying to work harder or trying to put ourselves into school. It didn't seem to fill us up anymore. And we realized there's a void in our life. And uh, we were promised a, a treat. We were promised uh, glory and success. If only we would apply ourselves to these things as a family. But we soon discovered what we thought was a treat was actually a trick. And uh, we tried to figure out that question, what is success to us? And we were successful at one point for all the you know, ways it was supposed to be. But we started asking ourselves questions that, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of us, if we're really honest with ourselves, we ask questions like, is there, is there more to life? You know, is this all there is, just going through the motions, going to school, going to work, going to school, you know, eating, going to bed, waking up. Is this really all there is to life? And, you know, as a, you know, high schooler, I started asking that question, is this all there is to life? And I, I went through a tailspin. I, I just got super depressed. And I, I became to be very suicidal. 
And my, my mom was in and out of the mental hospital. She was suicidal. And at one point, my, my, my dad and my sister said, we can't live with your mom. We don't want to live there anymore. But we, we're not going to allow you to move out of the house or the living situation with your mom because if you leave, she'll commit suicide. And, and life was tough. As a, as a you know, young teenager, they had me living with my mom so she wouldn't commit suicide. And I was thinking, I thought life was supposed to be a blessing. I thought life was supposed to be a treat, but it feels like I got a trick. Is there more to life? That scripture says, there's a way that appears to be right, but at the end, it leads to death. You know, I think we all have stories like this. And, you know, there was a community from Dartmouth uh, College University, and they gathered a bunch of secular scientists. So these aren't even Christian scientists, just a lot of intellectuals and minds from all, of the, all over the nation to kind of address this problem. Because we've been told by all means more consumption, more education, more money, more technology, cleanliness. This is supposed to give us a higher quality of life. But in America, we're not seeing this. In fact, at the time of this study, they said from 1950 to 1999, uh, the percentage of suicide had gone up by 137% in that time span, which really didn't make sense because most of us had bought into this American dream. More education, more wealth. And in this time in America, wealth was increasing like never before. Education was becoming accessible like never before, yet suicide rose by 137%. So they put together a study called Hardwired to Connect. And in this, secular scientists, I want you to pay attention to this. These are not Christian people. These are not the, uh, members of a religious society. They said this, in our studies, we found... That the reason for so much mental illness is because there is a fundamental disconnect in the lives of Americans. You see, people are becoming more isolated from not only other people, but they're becoming isolated from God as well. And even though they are getting more education, even though they're getting more money, because these two relationships are off kilter, people are becoming more isolated as technology arrives. We have lots of followers, but few friends. And God, people are leaving churches like never before. It's not, it's not okay to stand for a faith as much as it used to be. Even though people are getting more education and more money, because these relationships, communities, divorce, all these connections, people have having, you know, accountability and a support system. All of these things are disappearing, and faith is on the decline. It is causing a great rise in mental illness and suicide. We are hardwired to connect to people and to God. I think this is so interesting because we have been promised something, if we're really honest. Get a good job. Get a great education, collect lots of experiences, and you'll have a good life. But that, as we survey in our hearts, when we go to bed or when we're alone, when nobody's talking to us, when we're off of our Facebook, when we are just alone with ourselves, many of us are oftentimes asking ourselves, is this all there is to life? I mean, all of the ways we're trying to solve problems in the world, when it deals to, you know, wars and, and just injustice in the world, what do we do? We, we pour money into different countries. We pour technology into different countries. We pour education. But I'm telling you what, when it comes to finding success in life, true joy in life, true hope in life, there is no hope outside of these two relationships, relationships with people. And relationships with God. And tonight, you know, we have this costume party and we're having a lot of fun. But I want to communicate these truths to all of us tonight. Because I realize that not everybody here is a Christian. Not everybody here has grown up in the church. Not everybody here has found life and life abundantly. Like we started off talking about that message that Jesus said. Why did he come to the earth? John 10.10. The enemy, the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we've seen that time and time again. Lives that have been destroyed by addiction, anorexia, suicide, divorce, so much pain, dysfunctional relationships, an addiction to please, a performance mentality, 
The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and life more abundantly. But we fall into this trap. You know, there's a story I read that I feel describes our generation in a lot of ways. The story, a man was walking down a sidewalk, and he heard a bunch of people chanting. They were chanting the number 14, 14, 14, 14, 14. And he heard this chant, and they were really excited to be chanting. They were really excited to do this. And he saw a long wooden fence next to the sidewalk, and he realized he was going to be walking by it. And he heard it, 14. 14, 14, 14. So he decided, all right, I'm going to see what this is. Can I look over the fence? Can I look under it? He couldn't find anything to see. But then as he was walking, he saw a little hole in the fence. 14, 14, 14. So he walks over to that fence, and he looks in the hole to see what is this chanting? Why are they chanting 14, 14? And he looks in, and someone, boom, pokes him in the eye. And they all start cheering, and they start chanting, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15. Uh, So satisfying to trick little kids. (laughs) But I think, you know, even though the story is kind of funny, I feel like we as a generation, and young adults especially, are in danger of falling into the trap, falling into the trick that so many generations have fallen into before us. You know, we all have family lives. We all have homes. And if we were to take a survey here, I bet many of us say, my family is pretty jacked up, right? (laughs) We say, you know, my family is pretty messed up. They're pretty lost. I, I love them, but I do not want to have a family like them. I do not want to make the same decisions like them. And I hear people chuckling and nodding their heads. But the reality is we are making all the same decisions as they are. We're prioritizing the same things as they are for the most part. Trying to collect accolades, build up our own life, find more money, find more hope in possessions, trying to live the American dream. And I feel like the devil is just chanting, 14, 14, 14. He's coming to steal, kill, and destroy. 14, 14, 14. And we're just walking right along. Oh, yeah, if I get this job, I will be happy. I'll be secure. If I can get this relationship, I know this girl's no good for me. I know this boy is no good for me. But I will finally feel secure if I can be in this kind of relationship, if I can get this kind of money, if I can get this 14, 14. And we just kind of peek in and we look and it hurts us every time. And I felt that in my life as well as I was suicidal I found myself going through the same decisions, going through the same motions, prioritizing. Oh, uh, you know, I'm never going to make the decisions like my family. You know, in their divorce, we had three foreclosures. My mom's living out of a car, selling jewelry. I need to get a good job. I need to get a, get, get a good education. I just need to get out of the state and start over. And the devil is just saying, 14, 14. I was about to repeat the same mistakes as my family. But I believe there's hope. And that's why we are here gathered at Momentum. That's why we have this community of love. My prayer is for all of those who are walking in the darkness, all of those who are wanting a fresh start, all of those who are here saying, I need to start over. I don't want to live a jacked up life. I want to have true success through relationships. We exist as a community to help you in the process. You need to be in a community of love. You need to experience the love of the Father. God loves you so much, and he desires that you would have life and life more abundantly. But when it comes to problems in our life, I feel like we're just trying to take care of them ourselves. But I want to give you hope and a little bit of uh, maybe insecurity, and it's this. You're never going to be strong enough to solve all of your problems on your own. You're never going to be good enough to take care of all of your issues. Deep down inside, we've made mistakes. We've said things. We've committed actions that we thought we would never do. And we aren't strong enough to take care of them by ourselves. We need Jesus. I need Jesus. I needed him so bad in my darkness. You know, there's this man who was flying a plane. I don't remember the year he was flying it, but it was like a single-engine Cessna. And he's flying this plane. It's a propeller engine. And as he's flying it, he discovers uh, a chewing sound. And he's like, what is that sound? He listens. He hears the propeller. And he hears a little. He's like, what is that sound? (laughs) 
He's like, what is that sound? And he, he realizes that there is a little rat in his plane chewing on a line that fuels the propeller with gas. And he's like, that little dirty rat. You're chewing on my fuel line in the sky? Mm-mm. And he thinks, oh, I'm going to land this plane and I'm going to kill that rat. And uh, that's how we are a lot of times. We're thinking, you know, I got this problem in my life, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take care of it. You know, I'm gonna head, you know, head straight at it. And I'm gonna do it on my own strength, and it, it doesn't work. But this guy, before he landed his plane to kill the rat, he decided to try something differently. He took his plane, and instead of going lower, he actually tilted back, and he made his plane go higher into the sky. And what he did is genius. He flew his plane so high into the sky that there wasn't enough oxygen for the rat to survive anymore. And the rat, lacking oxygen, began to die and suffer a slow death. (laughs) Slow clap. Slow clap. (laughs) But I like this guy's mentality. Instead of going lower because of his problem, he took his problems higher to a place where they couldn't survive. And what I want to present to you guys is this, that our faith in Christianity, our journey, isn't all about us going lower and getting into our filth and getting into our mess. And a lot of times that's what we associate with church. We think it's, it's just ugly. It's the place where people are just judging each other or picking on each other or just thinking that they're better than other people. But really what we do is we acknowledge we have junk. We acknowledge we have issues. I acknowledge that I'm, I'm a pastor, but I know that I'm not perfect. I have issues. I have a history. I have a past. But what I do is I can take my plane higher where all my problems can't survive anymore and because the devil has no rain when it comes to the heavenlies these things can just die and as we take our problems to the throne of heaven as we take our issues and this bent this just something that's wrong with us to higher places all of our faults begin to disappear as we become a new creation in Jesus Christ it's so powerful And I want to tell you guys this here for maybe the first time, but you can find a new life in Jesus Christ. He can take you higher than you've ever gone before. He can deliver you. And, uh, you know, it's kind of crazy to think, but, you know, I'm a pastor now. But uh, in all of my time in school, in elementary school, in middle school, and in high school, I only got invited to church one time. One time in my whole public school education I got invited to church just one time, and I went. I went to church. I went to a a youth ministry kind of like this where we would party for Jesus, and, you know, we would say, come to a party, and, you know, they're singing songs, and people are lifting up their hands, and you're wondering, am I in a cult? Am I, (laughs) you know, we got eggs leading us into worship. This is definitely a cult. We're on a dirt road. I'm going to be murdered, and I remember thinking, what in the world? But I need hope. I need life, and I, I went to that church, and I, I just, you know, I only went because a hot girl invited me, and, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't this handsome back then, <laughs> nothing compared to what I am now, and I went to church, and uh, I heard a sermon, and the preacher said, you know what, you can't solve your own problems, just like I'm saying tonight, but Jesus, you were meant to have relationship with Jesus, You were meant to have a community of people who love you. You're meant to be in places and a place where you're not just tolerated, but you're celebrated by a God who loves you, by a God who's in love with you, by a community who will have your back when you're struggling. You don't just have to have money to have friends. You don't just have to have accolades and education to be of any worth. God gives you worth. You were made for love. You were created in the image of God. And I remember just as a suicidal young person, someone who had never been invited to church before, I received that message, and it changed my life. And I realized all my life I have accepted this trick. I've fallen into a trap, but now I realize I can find hope. And I gave my life to Jesus, and I began to follow God. And I'm telling you what, my rage and my depression and my suicide 
suicidal thoughts, those things went away immediately. Some things I had to work out, some things I'm still working out. But I began a relationship with God, and I found the study of that Dartmouth College to be true, that, you know, consumption and accolades, these do not fulfill us. But we all, as humans, created in the image of God, we all have a God-shaped void in our lives. We all have a God-shaped hole in our hearts. And we try to fill it with so many things, the pleasures of this earth, so many different people. We try to fill it with, you know, just like trying to find our self-worth. But these things will never be filled because the shape is perfectly filled for God and fitted for God. And nothing can fill this void except for God. You know, and in this room, there, there, there's a lot of people who have found hope in Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people who have been given a second chance, forgiven of their faults and their shortcomings. And uh, my prayer for tonight is that if you're walking in the darkness, if you feel like your life, your purpose, your destiny has been stolen, kill, killed, or destroyed, my prayer for tonight is that you'd have a story just like me. You'd have a story just like Katie. You'd have a story just like so many people in this room that I was lost, but Jesus found me. I was dead, but God made me alive, and he gave me life more abundantly. Man, that's why we exist here at Momentum. The whole purpose of this God party is to lead young adults like you into growing relationships with Jesus Christ and one another. There's no hope outside of God. We are built for relationships with God and people. Let's close our eyes and let's bow our heads. Dear Father, in, in this moment, I realize that people are here from all sorts of different backgrounds. Lord, I, I, I realize that people came in costumes and they came to an 18-plus God party and maybe they didn't even know what that meant. And Father, I, I pray that, Lord, for the people who, who are like me, people who are just looking for hope, People who have seen their lives destroyed or seen their families' lives destroyed. And they realize, man, I don't, I don't want to repeat the same mistakes of generation after generation. I don't want to be someone else who gets tricked or poked in the eye. Father, I pray that they would realize that you bring life and life more abundantly. But well, Father, I pray that we would exchange everything we have for everything that you have. Father, I love what you say in the scriptures in Matthew 13. You said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought. Father, we know we are no fools to give up what we can't keep, to gain what we can't lose. And so, Father, in this place, we realize, Lord, trying to find success outside of you will not work. Trying to find hope and money and education and accolades and buying in the American dream, it hasn't worked. There's so many families that have been jacked up because we thought we could find hope outside of you, God. But in this place, Lord, I ask that you speak to us and reveal to us how much you love us. And, you know, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I realize there are people in here, you're walking in darkness. You're walking without hope. You're walking without confusion. There are people in here, you're depressed, you're suicidal, you're lost, you're alone, you're tormented. You feel like the devil, that the life, that the world has stolen and killed your destiny, your purpose, that you're no longer good on the inside. You're just bombarded with shame and faults and all of these things, the past that haunts you. I pray that your story would be my story. I plead with you. Hear the message I didn't hear for so many years that Jesus loves you and he is willing to give you a new life and you will only find true life as long as you're connected to him.